Hey, so you've got to that point where you've finished the investigation, you've gathered the data, you've done all of the stuff. In fact, you've even drawn conclusions, established causal factors, and determined root cause. Now what? Well, it's time to compile everything into a report and maybe even prepare a presentation for management. Now, I want to be pretty serious here. Incident investigation reports have some serious consequences to them. Ideally, you want to have them result in change. You want to facilitate change. You want to make sure that the events that led up to the incident don't occur again. So yes, absolutely. However, incident reports can also lead to discipline, dismissal. They can end up being entered as evidence in court cases, used in arbitration. So it's imperative that they're done properly and done right the first time. You also want people to be able to read it while you do your presentation. You want them to be able to follow along. Here's a newsflash. 400 page reports really don't thrill anybody unless those are 400 important pages. Let's look at how you're going to put the report together, the composition. In the next video, I'm going to cover some ideas on how to do your presentation and how to present your report. But right now, let's look at what goes into it. Let's examine it. And you know what? Towards the end of the video, I'm going to address some pitfalls that you may encounter. They may even be considered as traps. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. It's important to stick with me to the end of the video. So there's lots of big questions to be asked about how to do a report and what goes into one. Believe it or not, it's pretty simple. In fact, it's as simple as what you've been doing through the investigation process thus far. In this series, we've worked our way through the incident investigation process. There's a link in the description for the whole entire playlist. If you're brand new and this is the first time, I encourage you to stop the video, go watch the playlist first and then come back. But if not, let's get into it. Realize one thing, we examined root cause. We asked why it occurred. In fact, in the last video, we asked a bunch of whys and that's how we determined the root cause using the five whys method. So now that you've put it together, you gotta add it all to a report and believe it or not, it's as simple as the flow of the investigation as I just mentioned. When you're delivering your report, you have to realize those that are reading it, they don't want to necessarily know all of the nitty gritty. They want to know what happened, why it happened, how to fix it and what you need them to do to make sure it doesn't occur again. Your flow is as important as the content. So remember, three O's, be organized, be objective and on point, meaning just facts, no opinions. I'm going to talk a lot about facts. So the investigation process, if you recall, remember the event occurred, you collected data, you made observations, you drew conclusions and you made recommendations. So your report is essentially the same. It's just a written form of your investigation flow. So the components you need to have, there's actually seven of them. You need to have the executive summary. You need to have a background, the methodology that was used, the observations that you made, the conclusions that you drew, the recommendations that you're going to make as a result of those conclusions, and of course, appendices, appendices, where to store all your data. So let's quickly look at each one of them, and then I'm going to address that elephant in the room, those pitfalls and traps. Very first thing is the executive summary. You have to realize one thing, although you went to a lot of work to write this report, and I've been there, I've done it, there's a lot of people who aren't going to read it. They're going to want to read, can I have the Coles Notes version? They're going to want to read a quick excerpt where possible. So that's the executive summary. Ideally, it's a one pager, no more. You can have a two page executive summary by all means, but ideally I found what worked best for me is to have a one page executive summary. This is the formula I've used in the executive summary. It's a background in a few sentences. Uh, think about it this way. Think about the date, what occurred, impact on the organization based on dollars, which would be damage and lost time, because the dollars are the hook. The dollar value is what attracts the attention of those that are in charge and those that can actually facilitate the change. So summarize in a paragraph what was found. Define the problem. Note the conclusions that you drew briefly based on the facts and findings. Define the solution based on what you found and of course how you reached the solution and with a broad form call to action. Note that there's more definitive recommendations that are located on page X of your report. Insert page where X is. And ideally, the executive summary should sum everything up, but also invite the reader to delve deeper within your report. Next is the background. Realistically, it's like the introduction to your report. 
It's what happened. So just like the executive summary, consider it this way. The occurrence, the event, what happened? Injuries or worse if they occurred, asset damage, any legal penalties, insurance or ancillary costs, lost production time, and of course, investigation time and cost. A lot of investigators don't consider the time that they spent, and believe it or not, that's a cost that's directly inherited from the incident, and it needs to be noted. For example, you might want to note, in this case, the forklift tipped over, spilled the load, resulted in no injuries, X number of dollars in, in asset damage, X number of hours lost at a cost of, the investigation time, including interviews, costed this amount of money. The next thing you want to include is the methodology. So this is how you gathered all the data. It doesn't need to be a long, um, drawn out process. You don't need to cover a lot of pages. You can likely do it in point form, although format's going to be totally dependent on your report. But it's how your observations were made and your data was gathered. So took photos, took samples, made measure or took measurements, witness interviews, etc. All of this will be summarized and the complete data, of course, will be inserted into your appendices. Now, one thing to note, depending on the scope of your investigation and what you did, you may need to include if certifications were required. So for instance, if the person had to do take sampling, were they qualified to do so? There may need to be a verification of qualification. Also, if those samples had to be examined, were they done by an independent lab and which one was the lab certified? And of course, who interpreted the findings? So that may need to be noted within your methodology, depending, of course, on your investigation. After your methodology is, of course, the observations you made. In this case, a good example would be you had a look at all of the pre-use checklists and you made note that the date was the only thing that seemed to change. They all looked identical. So you basically want to summarize what you found from the gathered data. Facts and facts only is the important thing here. Your opinion does not matter. It may be elicited, it may be asked for, but keep in mind one thing. If you always focus on the facts, nothing can be considered a personal error or a personal bias. The facts will speak for themselves because facts don't care about feelings. Now your tables and other technical mumble jumbo that you have, it should be in the appendices, but you, this is where you would quote portions of your data tables or portions of your measurements or indicate the odd photo that you took or you may want to have excerpts and quotes from the witness statements. This is what you would put in your observations. Now keep in mind your observations are how you draw your conclusions. You also will note that your observations will likely be part of your management presentation that you'll make later. So be careful on how you write them. You may be using your observations as some of your speaking notes. In this case, what we would likely list uh, using our forklift example, load was over capacity by how much versus the uh, original equipment manufacturer guidelines, what required service based on what documentation we found. I won't be transcribing any of the interviews, but I may include quotations from my interviews within the observations. Now the conclusions, this is where you put everything together. This is where you determine the different causal factors, and this is where you determined root cause. The forklift tipped over. Yes, we all agree with that. But why? Why was it overloaded? Remember the facts. In this case, if you watch the last video, you'll likely notice that management failed to establish or enforce any rules around breaks. They failed to establish or enforce the established health and safety processes around powered mobile equipment, such as requiring certificates, safe use processes, pre-use checks, maintenance, etc. So you'll likely notice that there's a lot of management deficiency. So once again, you'll use those conclusions that you drew to make recommendations. Now, recommendations, each one of your conclusions should have a recommendation that matches it. You need to focus on eliminating the causal factors. That's how you're going to prevent anything. They need to be practicable calls to action. This is not your opportunity to have a soapbox. This needs to be a practicable process on how you're going to eliminate future occurrences. Maybe isn't going to cut it, or we should try this is not going to cut it, and especially, in my opinion, is not going to cut it. So you might want to include things like management needs to reinforce breaks and break duration. Management needs to reinforce the HSC processes. Management makes, needs to make sure that there's a certification process for power and mobile equipment 
operators, and that the certification is renewed often, any remedial training needs to take place, should take place, etc. You're going to need to also list them in their order of priority and importance. A good thing to note, or a good thing to use, is your hazard assessment prioritization matrix that you use, or your risk assessment matrix. That might help you to list your recommendations in priority. But obviously, you're going to look at what the main root cause was, and eliminate that first, and then all of the causal factors, and as how they led up to the root cause. Finally, your appendices. This is where you stick all of the technical mumbo jumbo. Boring mumbo jumbo. But it's also where you stick your collection of photographs. It's also where you stick your witness statements. It's also one of the things I do is I take and I PDF all of my written notes and I also put them in there. So it's another important thing. Note to you or note to self. Don't put opinions or personal thoughts within your investigative notes because they can end up becoming part of a different investigation and they could be entered as evidence into court. So you want to make sure that it's just the facts and business only. So now, that elephant in the room or the pachyderm in the parlor, whatever way you want to talk about it. What do you do if, well, the forklift operator was your buddy, a buddy is responsible. Or what do you do if your immediate supervisor is responsible for one of those causal factors? What about if the management apathy of the whole entire health and safety management system is the root cause? Or even worse, what if part of the health and safety management system you're responsible for and it's deficient? Now what do you do? Realistically, this is pretty simple. If you've been following the video, you likely have it figured out. Integrity and ethics are absolutely essential. They're tantamount as a health and safety professional. Ours is a profession that needs to be beyond reproach. We need to be able to face scrutiny at any one time, and we need to have the trust of everybody within the workforce. So we cannot be falsifying facts. We have to portray facts as facts and all facts. We have to leave nothing out, and we gotta let the facts fuel and drive our conclusions. If we're seen as glossing something over that'll benefit the company, then we're on management side. If we're seen as covering for employees, then we're not going to be trusted by management. We have to be trusted by everyone. So our allegiance is to the truth more than anything else. So a couple of things that can help you in doing this. Avoid placing the blame on individuals where possible. Now, you might need to name names, but you don't need to shame. Okay, naming names, but not shaming names. You want to show without question how your conclusions match the findings and ob uh, through your observations and through the data. Remember, your opinions don't matter. If you have to use an opinion to demonstrate something, then you better go back and examine it and look for the facts. Where possible, allow for your recommendations to provide some redemption for those that were responsible for some of those causal factors. Allow them to learn from their mistakes and allow them to correct their mistakes. Sometimes that's the best lessons and that's the best way to facilitate change. Now, a couple of other warnings. Don't think that you have to reinforce or enforce the recommendations. If you've made a recommendation for man to management and they choose not to take it, that's their business, okay? A uh, couple of ideas for you. Keep a copy of the report if possible, unless you've signed non-disclosure agreements with the organization, in which case then you're gonna have to figure out another method around it. I'm not gonna go into it. If possible, retain a copy of the report. Now, the last, possible resort that you may have to go to is a whistleblower process. There is whistleblower legislation in a lot of ju different jurisdictions, but you know what? Realistically, if you've got to that point, you have to really do some introspective thinking. Myself personally, I might blow the whistle on an organization, but it would only be if there's going to be the potential for serious harm, injury, or even worse, a fatality if the same behavior takes place. If the organization is choosing to use a less expensive method in fixing something or a more roundabout way of correcting an incident or, correct, or correct, implementing corrective action, that's their business. It doesn't necessarily have to match what I've said as long as it meets the objective. So in short, okay, 400 page reports don't thrill anybody. Not only that, you wanna be simple and straightforward and to the point. So be organized, be objective, and be on point. Think about your composition of your report. It's virtually the same as your whole investigative process. Executive summary, background, methodology used, observations, conclusions, recommendations, and appendices. 
Consider how your report's going to be presented. If you have to do a presentation, you might want to be careful in how you're writing your report, because it may end up being your speaking notes. Remember, above all and beyond all, facts and facts only. Using this method and this process will help you to preserve your integrity and ethics with all of your coworkers, regardless of where they sit within the food chain of work, and it'll help you to gain and retain that respect as a safety professional. It's what you need and it's essential to our profession. Hey, thank you for hanging out till the end of the video. Do me a favor, if you like the video, give me a like, just hit that like button. I'm gonna leave a few more videos over here and there are more resources on health and safety. Feel free to have a look, view the videos, give me a comment. Let me know your thoughts. I appreciate every comment that I get, whether it's negative, positive, neutral, or otherwise. Also do me a favor. We need to lead by example. So please do me a favor. Whether you're at work, rest, or play, think about safety, talk about safety, but do safety so that you lead by example. Until we see each other again, take care. Bye for now.